You're listening to Podcateers. Welcome to episode 280 of Podcateers. This week I talk about something I've been planning for a long time. It involves Disneyland and Pokemon Go. I'll tell you about it in this episode. Gavin tells us about his experience at Oogie Boogie Bash. Plus, we have a discussion about the Disney Renaissance era of films. Remember that you can always join the conversation by leaving a comment on the blog post for this episode at podcateers.com 280. Or you can connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or on YouTube. Just search for Podcateers. This is our last week of fundraising before Walk for Hope as we walk in support of finding cures for women's cancers. We're doing our best to hit $1,500 before the walk, and as of this episode, we've raised $1,199. So we're $301 away from our new goal. Um, So can 301 of you just donate $1? That's all it takes, $1. Head over to TeamBoatWilly.com for a link to make a donation if you want to help us out. Remember that if you donate at least a dollar and want to provide the name of someone that you are donating in honor of or in memory of, we will proudly display their name on a board that we will be carrying on the day of the walk. Again, head over to TeamBoatWilly.com to make a donation. I can't start the episode without offering our gratitude to a wonderful group of people called the FGP Squad. The FGP Squad are our podcast fairy godparents and it's their generosity through their monthly contributions via Patreon that help make these episodes of Podcateers possible. If you like the podcast, it's a great time to join. More info on what the FGP Squad is, a link to sign up, or make a one-time donation can be found at podcateers.com FGP. To all of the members of the FGP squad, thank you very much as always for your continued support. All right, y'all ready? Let's play this thing. This is episode 280 of Podcateers. Troubleshooting 101 with <laughs> Podcateer's crew. Yep, that was an uh, hour and a half. <laughs> hey, but you know what? We got everything working, and that's what's important. I think so, yeah. That's what's important. We're, we've got like a Frankenstein's monster of different video audio solutions happening right now, so it's kind of appropriate for Halloween. <laughs> but you know yeah. what? Hmm. At least this isn't as scary as getting run after with uh, pitchforks and torches. Yeah, this is true. Unless you're into that sort of thing, which is why people go to things like <laughs> Halloween Horror Nights, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, that's fun. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's been it's been such a crazy weekend. <laughs> I I uh, I had some problems with my teeth. <laughs> I, I've been having this pain, and apparently there's like teeth like that are butting up against each other and when i was eating somehow a piece of that broke and uh i went to the dentist on our way to disneyland by the way we were we were (laughs) getting like ready we had stopped for food we were on our way to disneyland and um i broke my tooth (laughs) dude you know you know there's a dental office on center street just off of main street right yeah i figured i could it sounds like they do really good work in there too i figured i could go to that one but i've heard the sounds coming out of the windows and it doesn't sound too promising (laughs) so i figured i might want to go to something a little more local (laughs) i don't know it sounds like their hammers and chisels are working pretty good in there i guess i guess but (laughs) i was in pain and so instead of going to the park with my wife and my kids i ended up going to the dentist (laughs) and so uh the the dentist immediately looks at the tooth and says yeah that looks like it hurts does it hurt i was like yes of course i wouldn't be here if it didn't hurt (laughs) so he's like "Hmm, doesn't look like you have any cavities he starts like chipping away at my teeth and uh, (laughs) a filling comes out and he's like oh look you have a cavity i was like no my filling just came out what do you mean i got a cavity (laughs) so it was uh intense uh i now apparently require some kind of oral surgery to fix all of this and uh right now i'm i'm happily under the care of medication i'm just 
take a whole bunch of ibuprofen just to kind of get me through because it hurts. And so now I just need Ooh, for them question. to wait. Yeah. Do you still have your, your tooth? I do. I still have it. Put it under your pillow. <laughs> I don't think the tooth fairy is going to bring me Jack. You don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think you it works like that. Know. I still believe. I think it works when you lose the tooth for the first time. But when you lose the same tooth again, <laughs> I don't think the tooth fairy is like, uh-uh. I don't think that's how it works, boy. So, yeah, I don't think I'm going to get anything back. As a matter of fact, instead, I might get a bill this time. I think that's the way it's going to work. Aww. Yeah, my money's on that that option yeah. right there. So now I need to wait for them to schedule some stuff this week, and I don't know when it's going to happen, but I'm not looking forward to it. Uh, it was a horrible way to start Saturday. Yeah. And then, you know, a bunch of other craziness happened. You know, I was looking forward to being at the park because it was my first time there uh, in months. Right. I went just a, a week or two ago to go visit Adriana and Christina when they came down for Oogie Boogie Bash. But I didn't go into the park. I literally just went to the Esplanade, said hi to them, and I left right after. I couldn't stay because I had a whole bunch of work that I had to finish. And so this was my first time back in the park for some time. And I was super excited because I, I don't know if I shared this with you. I've probably shared it with some of the FGP squad, but I came up with this romanticized idea of merging together two things that I love, right? And that's Disneyland and Pokemon Go. And I've been playing Pokemon Go since 2016 when the game launched. I signed up maybe a week or two after the original launch. So I've been playing, stopped playing for a while because I got boring. My coworkers got me back into it. And then it was just trying to reach level 40. And level 40 is mm -hmm. like 20 billion points or something and i'm finally within twenty thousand of these xp in order to hit level 40 and that's essentially one tier five raid for one legendary pokemon which yeah. come up all the time so i stopped playing on my original account because again my idea is i want to go raid at sleeping beauty castle and i want to hit level 40 at Sleeping Beauty Castle. Like, that's my idea. Like, that's how I want to merge these two <laughs> things that I love. So over the weekend, went to the park. Or that was my idea, right? Go to the go to the park. Enjoy the Halloween stuff. Because it's also the last weekend for Halloween before it converts over to Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. At least next weekend. And so I figured, okay, I'll get to see the Mickey Pumpkin. I'll get to see the Haunted Mansion during Halloween time, even though I still think that it should remain Haunted Mansion till Halloween and then it should convert over after. But that's nope. a whole other conversation. <laughs> and while I'm there, I'm going to take advantage and I'm going to raid. I'm going to hit my level 40 and Kalu Kale, the circle of life will be complete. And then I can play on my account again. In the meantime, I've been playing on a second account because I can't not play. You know, there's a whole bunch of Halloween stuff going on. So I have another account that my boys use. I have three accounts and I have mine. The boys have the two other accounts that I created that they use whenever we go out for community days and stuff. And then Lynette has her own account. And so I started using the second account. Uh, the one that my youngest uses because he's, I mean, he doesn't play as much, so he's trailing behind all of us. So I'm playing on his to, like, beef his up, right? Mm -hmm. And I, by the time that I left the dentist, and I, I decided to go to Disneyland, by the way. <laughs> I left the dentist, <laughs> went to Disneyland, and uh, <laughs> I, I got there so late that the raids were done for the day. At least for, no. like, Sleeping Beauty Castle because usually what happens is throughout the day most gyms that have like a high interaction rate will get more raids mm -hmm. throughout the day and so sleeping beauty castle tends to get two or three during the day but i got there just late enough to not to miss all of them and so i was hoping and hoping there was one at the matterhorn there was one like in new orleans square happening there was one like right in front of dca and i thought nope it's got to be the one at the castle. I would have even settled for the partner statue. I would have even settled for the partner <laughs> statue, which is another gym. And neither the partner statue nor Sleeping Beauty Castle had a, a battle going on. So I was the sads 
that that didn't happen. Uh, I had a crazy interaction with another guest. Um, I, I, I don't want to give that interaction validity in any way because, you know, sometimes you just meet people that are... <sighs> yeah, I'm going to move on. So, uh, <laughs> so that happened... Uh, and when I didn't reach level 40, I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll go Sunday. Maybe I'll go Monday. I don't know. It just kind of depends on what's going on. Uh, and then earlier today, I was out doing a job. And uh, in California right now, there's been some crazy winds and there's a lot of wildfires going on. And by the way, if you're in the area of the wildfires, please stay safe. There's been a lot of evacuations going on and, you know, we're sending our thoughts and prayers to everybody that's out in that area because every year this goes on and it's just devastating to see what those fires do. So please stay safe. Um, I'm going to try to find some information. Uh, I know the Red Cross holds like different collections and uh, different uh, fundraisers and stuff to help the people that are affected by these wildfires. I'm going to try to find all of that information and I will put it in the blog post for this episode, podcasters.com slash 280. And that way, in case you guys want to help out with all of that, uh, you, you can just follow the links that we put on the website. Um, so yeah, so the winds uh, were, were super high. I put one of my cameras out because I was I was doing this job and the wind was so strong that it knocked it over and it cracked one of the lenses. Ay ay ay. Yeah. Aye. So it's been a weekend. Cracked teeth, cracked cameras. What next? I know, Hazen? right? Cracked Pokemon goals. I know, I know. Oh. Wow. Hey, but well, more this... importantly, the crack in my broken heart. Aww. Aww. Yeah, it's well crazy weekend, man. Maybe this this podcast will be the bright spot then. Seeing you guys is a bright spot. Oh man, you know? I'm gonna start crying. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was great because this morning I woke up early because I was I was getting ready for this job that I had to go do today. And the boys woke up, came over to me and they're like, Hey and you know, they give you a hug and good morning, Dad and I just looked at them and I thought, mm, I'm good. I'm okay. Because I was still kind of feeling I was still kind of feeling down after the interaction I had with that person at the park last night. And after just seeing the boys and seeing them smile and telling me all the stuff that they did while they were at the, at the park and all the stuff that they got a chance to win and buy. And it just cheered me up. You know, it, it reminds Aww. me that going to the park sometimes is a bummer because of stuff like that that happens. But at the same time, it brings so much joy to people that you just kind of have to set that aside. And you just have to realize that sometimes there's just going to be crappy interactions and you just have to try to not let it affect you, you know, as as much as it wants to affect mm -hmm. me, you know. So there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, in the meantime, it looks like I'm eating chicken nuggets. I'm going to eat like a squirrel, just kind of like <laughs> taking pieces and like shoving it onto one side of my mouth so that I chew on one side. And oh. we'll see how that goes. <laughs> how about you guys? How was your weekend? <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Uh, this weekend, like we've been binge watching the um, Haunting of Hill House series on <gasps> Netflix. How is it? Which is actually quite scary really um Ooh. so yeah it's it's really good i totally recommend it I, I know it's not a disney thing at all but if you like scary movies you like scary stuff especially ghosty stuff then i totally recommend it cool we yeah. saw us over the weekend and oh i haven't seen that one yeah it, apparently it had a lot of acclaim Mm -hmm. That it was super scary. Uh, it was written by either Ducky or Bunny. I don't remember who was who yeah. in the movie. Um, <laughs> but I thought it was going to be much scarier than it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was more psychological thriller than it was like yeah. horror film. Right. And uh, it was good. I, mm -hmm. I think the, the premise of the story and everything was, was pretty good. But overall, I was expecting to see something that was not going to allow me to sleep. And I was going to be in the corner like, can't sleep. <laughs> Clowns will eat me. Can't sleep. Oh. Clowns will eat me. <laughs> and I wasn't. Like, I went to sleep and I had this crazy dream about finding somewhere to dry clean my shirts because the place I <laughs> normally go to closed. 
So, I don't know. It was just weird. Maybe I drank something that I shouldn't have drank that day. I mean, adult errands can be horrifying, too. They are. <laughs> <laughs> they are. <laughs> Especially at those crazy prices. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. So, uh, yeah. well, well, speaking of scary things, I got to experience the Oogie Boogie Bash, and I didn't get a chance to talk about it on our last episode. Oh, dude. So, how was that, man? Tell us. Uh, it was very interesting. So I have been uh, going to the Disneyland um, Halloween party, which was called Mickey's Halloween party for many years now. I think I went the last six years. And it is something that does kind of feel samey every year because they basically roll out the same events, the same Special Halloween parade, pretty much the same fireworks. Uh, the Cadaver Dans perform on the Rivers of America. And, you know, you, you kind of get used to the same track listing of music. And, uh, you know, everything's kind of the same from year to year. But uh, I always loved what they did with the park during the Halloween party, you know, they gave it special lighting. There was lots of fog in various places, even some special effects and sound effects in certain nooks and crannies of the park. And it really cool. felt like a park wide celebration, right? Well, this year they're doing Oogie Boogie Bash at Disney California Adventure. Mm -hmm. And it's like a 50 50 thing of 50% of it is exactly the same as Mickey's Halloween party from Disneyland. Uh, and then the other 50% is either new offerings or just completely different than what they did at Disneyland. So I felt like it was pretty good. Um, I don't feel like it was as good as it has been at Disneyland in years past. Uh, to be totally honest. Uh, so they've got the same parade going on. Um, you don't get fireworks over there, but you get the uh, World of Color show called Villains Unite. Villainous. I think it's what it, Oh, Villainous. That's, I don't yes. know why I thought of Villains Unite. kind of like Villains uh, Unite, though. <laughs> yeah, Villainous. Uh, now, we did not get to view that. Um, our timing was off, so no. we didn't get to see that. Um but what they did have is a new spooky walkthrough, which they stole from Podcateers um, and their armchair Imagineering Brilliance. Uh, I've heard that's happened was, before. Uh, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> First time ever. Uh, but it, it's a walkthrough experience that they created in the Redwood Creek uh, Challenge area. Uh, if you follow social media, surely you've seen pictures and video from it. Um, it was pretty cool it was interesting it was kind of uh just a simple walkthrough experience you kind of walk through you got the special effects the lighting the ambiance the uh sounds and 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 music that was going on um i feel like it is like step one in something that could be really great mm. I, I really thought they did some cool things and it looked like they in, invested quite a bit in it um but i i do feel like it could have used a little bit more i mean for my money i would like a little more scary creepy i know that's not really on brand for disney but i would love it if they could start to compete with some of those scarier halloweeny experiences yeah maybe have a kid version and an adult version and the adult one's a lot scarier uh but what they created was really cool they used a lot of projection technology and a lot of cool led lights and things like that to create different ambiances and uh villainous kind of effects i guess the idea to that whole thing is that the villains we're in that area and they've since vacated, but they left this essence behind is kind of the idea. And so you'd, you'd walk through a section and it was like, oh, Scar was here and he kind of left his impression on this place. And you can see like the shadows of hyenas marching, you know, up against the rocks and things like that. So that's in the Villains Grove or is that? Just... Yes, this okay, is in so the Villains, is Villains Grove. Grove. Yeah, okay. all in the Villains Grove. Okay. Um, and... Yeah, it was it was pretty cool, but it was like I walked through once and then 
as the hours went by, I didn't really feel like I needed to go back and do it again. You know, like mm. it, it didn't really feel that repeatable. It yeah. felt a little bit simple, but that's why I kind of describe it as I feel like it's kind of step one. I feel like maybe they'll kind of evaluate what it was and plus it for next year and maybe even the year after that and so on and so forth and maybe add more villains because there were gaps, you know, as you walk through the trail where there's nothing happening, right? Okay. Um, ah. here, here's a weird thing that, that came up. I, I was there at the party with uh, my wife, Charlie, and then our friend Josh from the Animation Station podcast. Shout out to Josh. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we noticed that in the parade was the first place we noticed it. And then second, we noticed it in Villain's Grove. So I don't think this character was ever in the Halloween parade before, but he's currently on the Villain's float, the big finale float with all the villains. And that's Mm -hmm. the Cheshire Cat. He's also in the Villain's Grove. I'm sorry, but I don't consider the Cheshire Cat a villain. Like He is, though. Not at all. No, I don't think he is. I mean, the Queen of Hearts, yes. But, like, the Cheshire Cat, he's just kind of a mixer. Like, he's just kind of a practical joker. Like, I don't see him as evil in any way. Yeah, I, I think I, I think it just really depends on where you fall on his interactions with mm-hmm. Alice and his interactions throughout the, the film itself. I don't, yeah. I don't get that at all. I, I think that's gray area at best. Because I, that's yeah. weird. I've never seen him in in that light at all. Like I don't see him as a hero. Obviously, that's what in wrestling they call a tweener. Right there we go. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm, I'm talking at nauseum here. Uh, so let me let me wrap up my review. Um, so the, the one of the things that I always loved about the Halloween party is I like. All of the things I've talked about, the ambiance, the music, the shows, blah, blah, blah. But the best thing about it was most of the people there are trick-or-treating, and so the ride lines are non-existent. They turn off the fast passes. That's how great it is. And you just walk on to rides. Uh, That is still true at DCA, but there are so many less rides at DCA that you just kind of go round and around and around to the same rides and... You know, it gets a little bit repetitive on the same night, you know, whereas at Disneyland, I could hit 25 different rides just during the party, you know, because there's no lines and I could just I could basically do all the rides in the park. But in DCA, there's just not as many rides. So you kind of go through the rides a few times and you, you're kind of done, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I think all in all, I didn't really feel like. I personally got the full value out of it. I think if you're there specifically to trick or treat, which I didn't do, and to watch all of the special Halloween things, which we'd watched all but the um, the world of color. Yeah. And And, that kills me. (laughs) And then also the fact that they don't have the cadaver dance over there. Yeah. Uh, You know, for my money, I think this first, yeah, this first time around, I would give it like a six or seven out of ten. You know, okay. it was still on the good side, but I, I wouldn't give it a rave review. Hmm. So while you were speaking, I did a quick Google search because now I'm curious okay. because I, I think you have a point. I think that the Cheshire Cat is, you know, a very neutral character at some point. And yeah. I think part of the confusion is when you look at the Cheshire Cat in Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, like it's totally considered a villain. I don't even know what that is. Well, Once Upon a Time in Wonderland was the spinoff of the TV show Once Upon a Time. Oh. The Cheshire Cat was considered totally villainous. I think at some point in Disney canon, he was considered a villain. In some of the games, I believe he's considered a villain. In the parks, hmm. I think at some point he was considered a villain. But then he was recategorized outside of it. So to see or to hear that he's back on the villain's float... Uh, either the memo didn't get passed around uh, or he's still kind of an in-betweener where they kind of fit him in just to fill in space where they feel it's appropriate, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe that hmm. that's what we're seeing. I don't, I don't understand. I think I'd have to do more research because now I'm intrigued by this. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm intrigued by this whole Cheshire I think, Cat thing. I think this could be a, a pretty lengthy debate on if he's a villain yeah. or not. Hero or villain? The Cheshire Cat. Well, he's definitely not oh, a yeah. hero, but I would say he's not a villain. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. a mixer. Yeah. He's a practical joker, uh, you know, uh, a prankster. Hmm. But I don't oh, know. Man. It, it's interesting. I, so, it, I was kind of surprised that they presented him so prominently in two different areas as a villain. Man, I kind of wish you had seen Villainous because it looked like a really cool show. And mm-hmm. I kind of want the music behind it, too. Um, oh, yeah. So I was there that weekend, but I was at the Grand. So mm-hmm. I got to see it from bird's oh, eye nice. view. Oh, okay. Oh, man. Uh, what they did, especially for Facilier, mm-hmm. dang, Disney could do some really cool stuff with those yeah. LEDs. Oh, yeah. So it's just, I, I have not seen any video. I will see video because I need to see, like, the screen. I couldn't really see it. Mm-hmm. But, man, I'm so So bummed. I <laughs> decided to travel around the world and watch the show via YouTube like I tend to do when I can't go to these events. <laughs> And I did yep. watch uh-huh. it, and it's fantastic. They, I remember yeah. watching the Maleficent portion of it, and I'm not exactly going to say what happens. I, I, well, you may know already because you saw it from bird's eye view. But the yeah. way that they outline her in the like the the lights, I I just thought we need more of this. We need more of this. Right? <laughs> they showed more elements, and I'm like, yes. what? What? Yeah, it, it was so well done. Um, if you haven't watched the video, I'll find a good version of it on YouTube, and I'll put it in the blog post for the episode, podcasters.com slash 290. Check it out. It's a fantastic show. I hope that they bring this back. Even if they move the Halloween yes. party back to Disneyland, if this was a recurring thing on Halloween going forward, this would be just a great addition and a great way to get people to come to California Adventure in the evening hours during the Halloween time mm-hmm. because, ah, oh, it's such a great show. Yeah, it sounded good. We just we just didn't uh, – the timing was off for us, and we, we just weren't able to do it. Did you get on Monsters After Dark this year? Oh, of course, yes. Was there anything different than the previous version of it? Um, honestly, I feel like this year they're not – um, I, I feel like the cast members aren't as fully invested in being a part of the show like they were when it Aww. originally opened, mm. you know, because we saw a lot of cast members that original year, like really acting it out like they were, you know, escaping themselves or that they were injured or something. Uh, and it, there seemed to be less of that. But the ride is still awesome. It's really cool. I love that. You know, that ride is great for its variety already. And the fact that they yeah. bring us like, uh, what is it, a sixth or seventh new edition during the Halloween season is awesome. Well, I'm hoping that next year we'll get a chance to to check out whatever they do, whether it's Oogie Boogie Bash 2 or whether they do, you know, Mickey's Halloween party. Uh, I think we're up for it again. This year we tried to get tickets for Oogie Boogie Bash, but the days that we had available that we could go were sold out. And so we mm-hmm. just opted not to try to rearrange stuff to go on a different day. Yeah. <clears throat> because we were going to go uh, without our kids. We were. It was just going to be mm-hmm. something that uh, my wife and I ended up doing together. But, yeah, so hopefully next year we're able to work all that out. And, I don't know, maybe we'll take the boys. <laughs> I feel like that's one of those <laughs> things. Like, it's just like date night, right? You just go and you kind of enjoy yeah. yourself. Yeah. I mean, you had Josh there, so it's kind of like having one of your kids. Pretty, pretty much. You know? yeah. So yeah. there's that. You nailed it. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. Josh. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have to ask. Uh, overall, what was your favorite part of the experience? Uh, you you kind of talked a little bit about some of the best and worst parts of it. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your favorite part overall? Um, honestly, you know, they don't do as broad of a transformation in DCA as I felt like they did during the party at Disneyland. So even though I said it felt like it was an early iteration, I still think the Villain's Grove was my favorite thing. Uh, because I've seen the parade. It's the same old parade. You know, it's like there's nothing different about the parade. Mm -hmm. Um, so we didn't even stop and watch it. We were just like walking by it a couple times. Um... 
and you know there there aren't a whole lot of other things so we didn't get to see villainous that might have been my favorite if i saw it but villains grove is the answer got it got nice. it nice yeah cool well uh, i did want to do a quick follow up uh, that was a great recap of Oogie Boogie Bash. Uh, if you guys remember in the last episode, I did a quick shout out to Adriana and Christina because they came out and they said hello while they were at Oogie Boogie Bash. And uh, I mentioned a couple of things that I, I remembered seeing in photos that people were posting about the Kingdom Hearts area and only seeing one of the two characters. Donald and Goofy are primarily the two characters that are associated with the main portion of the game because they're kind of your companions throughout the the saga. Christina left a comment on the blog post for the episode where she said, love the episode. Thanks for the shout out. Also, it was great to meet you. She says she definitely owes me a beer. I'm going to totally take you up on that offer when we are uh, in your (laughs) area. Uh, It says, I also wanted to confirm that both Goofy and Donald are available for the Kingdom Hearts photo op. And lastly, Alolan Marowak is definitely the queen of the tropical hideaway. Boom! Mic drop! (laughs) I had to drop that in there because, I mean, look, Alolan Marowak. It's a tropical thing, you know? It's got the whole staff on fire and it just looks cool yeah. and so yeah <laughs> okay so that kind of reminded me of another thing that i found interesting about oogie boogie bash you know at the mickey's halloween party in the past all of the character meet and greets what was cool about it is that it was all villains mm. right it's like the only time of right. year that you get to see all these random villains walking around you know and they wave goodbye to you from the train station as you leave at the end of the night right mm-hmm at DCA, it was just a random set of characters. Like, we saw um, Dopey. We saw like evil Kim Dopey? Possible. No. <laughs> Regular Dopey. We saw Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable. We saw Donald and Goofy of Kingdom Hearts. Like, it, was, it wasn't villains. It was just characters. Like, random characters that they don't bring out usually. Or they're, like, trying to promote or something. Interesting. Like, I thought that was really weird. Like, that was one of the cool things about it is that... You know, you could see Judge Frollo or some other yeah. villain walking around that you don't see all the time, right? Huh. It was right. just regular characters. I thought that was really weird. That is interesting. I wonder if they... That's true. I wonder if they brought them out because they just feel like they have a little bit more leeway because of the park. Like, there isn't this Maybe. deep association well, with certain Disney characters as as you have at Disneyland proper. Maybe. I, I don't know. weird. I thought it was really weird. I actually, I've seen a picture of the blue fairy. What? Really? Yeah. I didn't know she was evil wow, now. I didn't, I didn't Talk see her. about a heel cool. turn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Man. That that kind of, that threw me off. I don't know. Hmm. Interesting. Strangeness. Mm. Well, uh, before we continue, I do want to follow up with a couple more comments. Because since we're, uh, we were talking about this little tiki stuff in Alolan Marowak. Uh, There was a comment from Helen, uh, one of the admins over with our friends at the Die Hard Disney Nuts Facebook fan group. Shout out to everyone there. Helen said to this was actually a message to Melissa, but she shared it with me. And it says, tell Hazen to take a look at the Skipper's Canteen at Walt Disney World. It's based around the cruise, joking servers included. Now, around the same time when we posted the episode, we got a comment from the Adventurers Club comic over on Instagram that said, can't wait to hear this one. Hopefully there's a whole lot of SEA ideas. The SEA, of course, is the Society of Explorers and Adventurers. I'm kind of enamored with the whole idea of that concept, and I love how it's kind of spread out along along the parks. And no joke. I was so upset at myself, and I mentioned this to you guys after we were done recording, because in my notes, when I was talking about the restaurant, I was like, I had the Jurassic Fork comment, and then I said, incorporate SEA. And for some reason, while we were recording, I had one of those, like, squirrel, like, moments, and I totally (laughs) blanked and forgot, like, what I felt was the most important part of my idea. And so when... (laughs) We were were just so caught up. I know, and... Like when when Helen brought it up after you sent me the comment and when it was brought up on Instagram, uh, I just thought, well, shame on me. So, yeah, my (laughs) idea incorporated it. But, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't mention it 
but it would be cool to have something that's SEA related. And there kind of is, because if you go into the Tropical Hideaway, there's a lot of SEA references that weren't in the park before. And if you kind of look around the Jungle Cruise queue, you can kind of see some elements of that. I just wish it was a little bit more prominent in the park, you know, like it is mm -hmm. at Walt Disney World. Uh, but yeah, so thank you everyone for your comments. Uh, it's fantastic. We love hearing from you. We love hearing your thoughts and how you feel about things that we talk about. So keep them coming. Please join the conversation over on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or even on YouTube if that's where you're listening to this episode. Just follow Podketeers on any of those networks. That's P O D K E T. Because sometimes people think there's an A there. Double E R S <laughs> podcast ears. <laughs> oh, I gotta tell you guys, we have a new tiki shirt. <laughs> what? Yes. yes. Podcateers.com <laughs> slash gear. There's a brand new design called Tiki Idol. Check it out. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. I think I'll throw up a coupon code, just ten percent off. Just use the code Tiki if you guys want to grab uh, that shirt. It's available in a couple of different colors. Check it out. We'll post it on the Instagram stories, and hopefully you guys enjoy it. It's one of our favorite designs, and yeah. But, but I mean, every time I say it's one of my favorite designs, I feel like I'm being super totally biased because most <laughs> of the time I come up with that stuff. But, I, I mean, I, I think it looks cool. They're awesome. It definitely I, looks, I think cool. It looks cool. Yeah. So. Okay, uh, I think it's time to move on to our main topic for this week. Uh, it's a very interesting one. I'm curious to see what Gavin has to say and the discussion that comes from this. But before we do, I do want to remind you that this episode of Podcateers is brought to you by a fantastic group of people called the FGP Squad. The FGP Squad are our podcast fairy godparents, and they help us out with monthly contributions via Patreon. If you want a little bit more information on how you can become part of the FGP Squad because you just happen to love this podcast and you want to help us out, head over to podcasters.com slash FGP for more information. You will also find a link to sign up or even make a one-time donation. If you sign up for a recurring donation of $5 or more, you get the exclusive Podcasters Fairy Godparent button. You'll get access to some exclusive posts for the FGP squad and more, including some giveaways. So again, podcasters.com slash FGP is where you want to go for more information. To all of the members of the FGP squad, we just want to say thank you for your support. All right. So this week's topic is the cultural impact of the Disney Renaissance. Gavin, lay down some knowledge, man. All right, kids. We're going to have... We're going to have a little bit of a different format this week. Uh, I really thought about this topic um, for a while because I think it is near and dear to uh, all Disney fans in and around our age bracket, and that is the Disney Renaissance. So most of us that are in our 30s and 40s uh, grew up with the films that are generally considered part of the Disney Renaissance. And, you know, they formed a major part of our fandom if we became Disney fans, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think you can really argue that fact. I think that, you know, the, the Disney Renaissance is the greatest reason most of us that are, you know, in our 30s and 40s today are Disney fans, right? So for those people um, that don't exactly know what the Disney Renaissance is, why don't you lay a quick um, yeah. overview of the movies that span that section? Oh, see, I'm so glad you asked this because <laughs> uh, we're going to discuss, you know, exactly what is traditionally considered the start and finish of the Renaissance and what maybe should be considered and, you know, maybe some gray area there. Uh, ah. So... Typically, the Disney Renaissance is considered what the Disney Animation Studios released in theaters between 1989 and 1999. It was a run of 10 films that uh, had unprecedented uh, critical and commercial success, with the one exception being the original golden era of feature animated films uh, in the late 30s and early 1940s at the Disney Studio. So 
most people would define the Renaissance as beginning with The Little Mermaid in 1989 and ending with Tarzan in 99. So the films that fall between those are The Rescuers Down Under, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, Hercules, and Mulan. So that is basically what's generally accepted as the Disney Renaissance period. Um, so, you know, directly preceding it, you know, we have uh, the films of the late 80s, mid to late 80s, uh, with The Black Cauldron in 85, The Great Mouse Detective, and then Oliver and Company. Directly after it, I think, is an easier border to draw because directly after it, we have Fantasia 2000 and then Dinosaur, which a lot of Disney fans have never even seen. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a clear drop off at the end there. Um, but, you know, I think there's some discussion to be had about where we actually mark as the beginning of the Renaissance, because a lot of things had to come into place for this to happen. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so. Let me give a little bit of a back history of the company leading into this era uh, to kind of set the stage, so to speak. So after Walt passed away, um, and then additionally after his brother Roy passed away, the studio leadership, you know, didn't have them as guiding lights anymore to really um, steer the ship. And it was pretty soon thereafter recognized how important their impact on what was being done really was because for about two decades you really had an up and down output from the disney studio you know the the films were not critically acclaimed on the same level and in many ways they certainly were not as commercially successful uh, one of the things they did is they abandoned the well-known fairy tale genre and, you know, began telling a lot of other stories, um, some of them with more success than others. But, you know, by and large, it's a it's a major downturn in the studio's progress. Um, leading into the 80s, however, um, you had a, a, a big tumultuous shift in leadership and. Uh, of course, a big part of this was in 1984 when um, Michael Eisner more or less seized power and uh, brought in his associate, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Uh, and from that point on, the fortunes of the Disney studio drastically changed. So, you know, kind of like our Cheshire Cat discussion, <laughs> are these guys villains? Are they not villains? Yeah. Like they, you know, there's a lot of bad taste in, in many people's mouths about the way they operated, but um, a lot of the su successes can't be denied, right? Um, so a lot of what uh, spurred on this renaissance and a lot of what happens with art in general is it's born out of adversity. You know, a lot of the great artistic achievements were, you know, born that way. You know, there's some sort of strife or struggle or challenge that, you know, just uh, engenders this creative spirit, this cry to, you know, create something beyond and better and, you know, lift yourself up with that. And I think that's true of the Disney animation studio as well. So they, they went through a series of challenge, basically, leading up to this period. The biggest one, of course, happened when Don Bluth and 11 other animators mutinied, bolted from the Disney Animation Studio, and started their own rival studio. And on top of that, that rival studio, Don Bluth Productions, became their major competitor. Yeah. And in many ways, was the top animation studio of the 1980s. Uh, there was there was a lot of back and forth as far as gross receipts, um, but Don Bluth, you know, created an American Tale, um, All Dogs Go to Heaven, The Land Before Time, like really iconic '80s animated films, right? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. even the secret of nim which which preceded all of those um like they're really iconic and when we think of iconic 80s disney movies you know we think of the last three really we think of the great mouse detective oliver and company and then little mermaid right um yeah not many people think of fox and the hound or black cauldron uh so you know they had first for the first time ever, really, they had a true rival studio who was, in some cases, kicking their butts. Yeah. Um, on top of that, uh, in a strange move, Michael Eisner uh, decided to kick the animators off the studio lot and basically put them in temporary trailers in Glendale. And for the next eight years, from 80, no, nine years, from 85 all the way to 94, the end of 94, they worked out of those trailers. Temporary quarters. That's where some of the greatest magic they ever created happened. And they weren't in fancy studios. They weren't on the lot with all those, you know, studio spots specifically designed for animation that Walt built, you know, way back in the day. They were just in temporary trailers with little desks and they were in cramped quarters. But sometimes that's what great creativity needs, you know, yep. is that kind of desperation. And it seems to be true with the Disney studio. Um, so basically, uh, you know, that's kind of a little bit of the story of how it all happened. Um, and I, I really want to talk about you know, what the Disney Renaissance means, how we define it, you know, what we think of it and what we feel like is its um, lasting impact. Um, so before we get to my question and answer kind of period where I'm going to kind of get a conversation going, I just want to talk a little bit more about kind of where I feel like the Disney Renaissance really began. And I think it really started much earlier than 1989, because while they had limited successes in the 80s, the amount of experimentation that they were doing in the 80s is huge, right? So going all the way back to a favorite of Melissa and mine, to Tron in 1982, <laughs> uh, the, yeah. they were really um, helping to create experimental animation techniques with that film. Um and, you know, that that was a very important moment for a lot of things. It, it helped them understand the potential of computer animation and um, alternative experimental techniques. Of course, it most notably inspired John Lasseter to really invest his career in computer animation. And we all know what happened after that. You know, they were really pushing other boundaries like dark themes, um, you know, more intense action in things like The Black Cauldron. And even yep. though that was a total flop that got beat by the Care Bears movie that year, uh, artistically, <laughs> they did some really interesting <laughs> things um, that are yeah. worth looking Don't at. Don't knock the Care Bears movie, man. That is a cinematic adventure. Oh, hey, I, I'm, I'm cool with Care Bears. It's true. <laughs> Care Bears stare, man. I'm uh, sure we all had one. Uh, <laughs> And many people don't realize this, but they invested in the uh, CAPS program, which was the computer animated um, like cell shading program um, in way back in the early 80s. And all of their animated feature films after The Fox and the Hound used some element of computer animation. Yeah. You know, thought, usually they were for highlight segments. I thought The Black Cauldron but, was the only one that didn't during that, that time. Like Fox and the Hound, Mouse Detective, and Oliver and Company. Oh, maybe, it, maybe it's Black had, Cauldron. Yeah. But I think Black Cauldron yeah, was yeah, the yeah, only yeah. one in that time frame that didn't have CGI elements. I think you might be yeah. right. I think I might have switched those two. Um, so, you know, they were early adopters of computer technology, uh, even though it was Pixar that went on to really pioneer that yeah. field. Um, so all of this kind of experimentation, you know, kind of leads into this era of success which began truly with little mermaid but to me it's important to identify that foundational period that led into it you know all these young animators and and many don't know this but like basically right around the early 80s is when the last of the nine old men retired 
And so you had none of the original guard, that original group of guys that truly developed animation in the way we know it today. They weren't around anymore. It was a new crop of guys, young guys that were just chomping at the bit to create something cool and new. And these are the guys that were, you know, struggling to find their way throughout most of the 80s, but with experimentation and then finally with some funding and some, you know, kind of iron fisted guidance by Jeffrey Katzenberg, you know, honed it into the string of, you know, really well crafted films that came from 89 to 99. Yeah. So, um, I'm going to ask you guys a few questions here and I just kind of want to use this as a conversation. You know, I'm not going to keep score. Uh, there's <laughs> no right or wrong answer. This is, this is opinions. This is thoughts on, on how we view the Disney Renaissance and what it means to us. So I just want to start by asking you guys and who, whoever wants to go first can go first. Um, how do you define the Disney Renaissance? Like what is it that comes to your head when somebody says the Disney Renaissance? I guess for me, it's more of imagination or I should say this imagination with stories, mm -hmm. like having them like when I, I see when I've seen these movies the first time, I mean, I wanted to be in those movies. I like, I don't know why I'm making this complicated. <laughs> <laughs> it's like pretty much at a young age, I wanted to make those things or draw those things. And mm -hmm. it, that's what it was. It's just, it's just sparked that little creativity for me. Yeah. I think it, it's interesting that, you know, you asked the question that way, because this is certainly something that I've thought about a lot over the years, because you know, you mentioned how the 80s were kind of the end of the original Nine Old Men. To mm -hmm. me, I, I feel that it was in the 80s where the there was this big shift in trying to train a bunch of new people to have the animation style that the original guard, the Nine Old Men, taught the animators. Mm -hmm. And then I mm -hmm. feel like one of the people that was most prominent in trying to carry that out of the 80s was Andreas Stasia. Because Andreas sure. Stasia, he was hired by Eric Larson or in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And then he was basically working under the tutelage of seven of the original Nine Old Men. So he learned mm -hmm. a lot of techniques and kind of helped pass a lot of that on to the next generation. During this shift in the 80s, you're right, there was a lot of experimentation and there was a lot of, um, especially with, with Fox and the Hound and Mouse Detective, you know, Oliver and company, there was this shift into CGI and seeing how that could be incorporated to help out with scenes. Because if you think about it, uh, the age right before that, the Silver Age, there was a lot of repeated frames. There was a lot of things that they did mm -hmm. in order to try to keep costs down. Right. There wasn't as much experimentation. It was just try to get it done as nicely as possible with these wonderful backgrounds, but try to recycle as much as possible. That's mm -hmm. still the case in the Bronze Age, which is the, the era it, in between like the 1970 to like 88 ish before what mm -hmm. most people consider right. the Disney Renaissance. Right. But in that era, mm -hmm. there was a lot more heavy lines in the animation. There was these big, bold black lines in a lot of the, the films. And so people consider that like the scratchy art era. Right. Like there, yeah. there it wasn't as refined and it wasn't as. Uh, as clean as what the Disney Renaissance looked. Oliver and mm -hmm. Company, I would say, was uh, maybe even Mouse Detective, were kind of the first ones to really step out of that big, bold, black line look and step into something that was cleaner and more refined. So yeah. if anything, mm -hmm. the Renaissance kind of kicked off with the Great Mouse Detective. But I think when most people think of what the Renaissance means to them, it means... When did Disney really start making money again? And that's really right. defined by oh, The Little point. Mermaid. Because up yeah. until then, all those other movies, I mean, even having Billy Joel sing all of the songs for Oliver and Company didn't make a huge dent in the box office the way that they anticipated it. However, right. Oliver and Company did kick off an amazing 
trend of bringing on these super established artists to start contributing and making this amazing music for these Disney films. And so yeah. Oliver and Company, outside of a couple other films that I think kind of are defined by their music, like the, Aristoc uh, the Aristocats and maybe even the Jungle Book, the Renaissance is really this point in Disney history where the storytelling was done primarily through song, you know, yeah. and the songs yeah. really helped drive the movies forward. Yeah. And it wasn't just this thing that they popped in to kind of supplement what was happening. It really helped mm -hmm. drive the story along. Um, and that, I mean, has continued, but there's this clear delineation after Mulan where even though there was music, like the storytelling kind of suffered as soon as the Emperor's New Groove kind of, you know, kicked off the, the post era, you know, so that that's what I think kind of defines the Disney Renaissance in general. Like what really made money for Disney during that time frame and yeah. where did it kind of stop? And that's kind of it. Like if you think about it, Mermaid through Mulan were the ones that made the most money. Emperor's New Groove and on up until like Lilo and Stitch kind of kicked it back in were really the ones that didn't. And you know what I mean? So that that's what it yeah. kind of means to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you hit on some really good points there. And I, and I think you're, you're right on the money with a lot of that. You know, I, I think, you know, back to your um, comments about Andre Stasia and, you know, him kind of being the bridge between the old and the new eras. Um, I, I can see a lot of his influence um, artistically, especially in his style of animation, uh, for sure. Uh, but I think one of the keys to this transition and one of the real things that Eisner and Katzenberg injected into the company was their transition to modernity. You know, the, everything became modern animated films yeah. where in the 80s they were still trying to like recapture old magic you know they're still trying to make things like 101 dalmatians and like peter pan and like even back in the golden era you know like they were still trying to capture something that they couldn't quite anymore because it didn't translate anymore right they didn't have any direct right. connection to that type of storytelling and what they brought in was a modern feel which spoke to modern audiences mm -hmm. And one of the ways that they did that is the other thing you brought up. They brought in music. They brought music back to the animated film, which had been really absent for the better part of two decades. And, you know, you're right with Oliver and company, but it's really with Little Mermaid that they truly designed them as musicals, you know, in a, in a Broadway sense. And that was one of Katzenberg's big, big... Uh, priorities was to you know he, there were a couple films after mermaid that originally weren't intended to be like musicals that he's like no 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 we've struck gold here we're going to push these all as musicals you know he he really wanted to do that and i think those two things you know bringing things modern contemporary jokes with things like aladdin you know modern quick paced storytelling and the those insane musical soundtracks uh, really bring the Renaissance to full bloom, I feel. And, you know, where I kind of don't want to include Oliver and company is that, you know, it's just one Disney music person wrote all the music. Where they finally figured it out is, well, let's bring in either Broadway musical people like Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, or if we're going to bring in somebody, this is what they should have done with Billy Joel, but they didn't. If we're going to bring in somebody like Elton John or Phil Collins, they're going to write this music. Mm -hmm. You know, Billy Joel should have written those songs yeah, instead of just you know, singing. He them, would yeah. have written exactly. He would have written fantastic songs for that movie, but they hadn't quite figured that out yet because it hadn't been done with one exception of Louis Prima back in 1967 for the Jungle yep. Book. You know, yeah. that's it. So, yeah, I, I think those are all really, really good points. Um, so that being said, that kind of leads right into my next question is, what do you guys feel like separates the Disney Renaissance from any other era, either before or after? We may have already identified it, but if there's anything else you guys feel like really separate it, I'd be interested to know. Oh, 
I want to see the 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 style. Like the artistic the drawing style? style. I yeah. mean, that the colors. It's just a bright palette. Um, because you don't really see like watercolor. You don't see any of that. Mm-hmm. So it's just you see that style, and I feel like you don't see it until Emperor's New Groove, where it kind of comes back to that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I see. Yeah. Yeah. I. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, the the color palettes are are a great observation, but I I I think the music was really what separated it. Like at least for mm-hmm. me, I yeah. I think the music was really the driving force of the Renaissance era. Yeah. Yeah, I I think when I when I go back and back and back over it, I I keep coming back to the music myself. But I think Melissa brings up a really good point because yeah, the colors in general in those renaissance films are much punchier there's lots of really bright jewel tones even even some tones bordering on fluorescent colors uh and you know really bright vibrancy that just kind of jumps off the screen and yeah so many of those early golden era films they did feel like kind of watercolors on like manila colored paper almost you know so there wasn't quite it they were going for a more painterly artistic look right um Mm -hmm. but but the the films of the 90s were going for like cinematic eye candy you know and i think they really achieved that with several of their films for me too it's when they really stepped it up a notch with their um set designing and environments Mm -hmm. because You know, some of those films, they did real world building, you know, like you felt like you really explored the Pride Lands. You know, you felt like you really were going down many different avenues and alleys and and even sewers in Paris in Hunchback of Notre Dame. You know, like they did so much research and so put so much more detail in all of the scenes You know, you had that level of beauty and detail in a lot of the early films, but they were they were severely limited location wise. You know, like in in the 90s, you feel like you really traveled a length and breadth of of a land, you know, in those films. And I think that that's really cool. Uh, I always appreciate that in a film. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the keys. Everything went basically from being a backdrop to a background in the movie yes so it was a huge shift yeah yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. and they had better because of the computer aided uh, animation that was happening and just better understanding of contemporary filmmaking you had much more dynamic shots you know where you're going swooping in and panning out and you know uh you know i think of all those cool like depth of field focus changes in lion king and things like that were just really awesome to see in an animated film so yeah i it's it's crazy because the more i think about it the more like singular this 10-year period becomes to me you know uh cool um okay so now that we're at this point in our discussion i really want to get down to brass tacks a little bit and find out like specifically where do you feel like the disney renaissance begins um you know is it great mass detective is it uh oliver and company is it something we haven't even mentioned you know in the 80s uh michael eisner um started two new studios uh for the disney company one of them was touchstone pictures um and touchstone gave us who framed roger rabbit in 1988 which I consider a Disney masterpiece and a very underrated film. And, you know, I think that there is some argument there that that jump started things even before Little Mermaid. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there, there are things like that to consider as well. Uh, so where, where do you guys really see the beginning of what you consider to be the Disney Renaissance? For me, it's definitely Little Mermaid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think Little Mermaid um, really set the tone for uh, the Disney Renaissance? Or do you feel like it just kind of set the table, so to speak, so that others could launch from there and and grow and and get better? 
I think for me, it's basically like it's the fairy tale. I mean, it's sad that I'm missing out and I'm not mentioning Oliver and Company and or um, Great Mouse Detective, mm-hmm. which I love. Sure. But it's something, and I think it's just the Little Mermaid, the details, the colors, just the story, how they presented it, and again, yeah, music. I mean, it's just something new that we're that we're getting. Mm-hmm. in animation and i think that's what it is that starts it for me and it's a good you brought up the good point of who framed roger rabbit i mean that had everything too and not just that the crossovers and everything mm-hmm. but for me it's the little mermaid that does it for me nice so uh, I like you, it. you brought up an interesting point about roger rabbit that there was so many crossovers and i think as much cinematic innovation there was in Foo Frame Roger Rabbit. Part of the reason mm-hmm. I don't think it's widely considered part of the Disney Renaissance is twofold. One, it had crossovers that were not Disney. And two, it was partially yeah. live action. For the most part, the Renaissance is all animated films. And when you think about the different eras and what they spawned, there really aren't a lot of live action pieces that you can consider part of those different eras. Uh, Even when you try to slot a film like Mary Poppins, Mary Poppins was released with a slew of amazing animated films, but it's not necessarily considered a part of, you know, the, the golden era, the wartime era, or even the silver age. Right. So it, it, mm-hmm. those films that have some kind of live action segment to them seem to kind of stand in a category of their own or are classified differently than a lot of these animated features are. Sure. Roger Rabbit, I think, falls into that category primarily because of the live action sense to it. Oliver and Company, I don't consider part of the Disney Renaissance, even though it was the closest thing to what's considered the Disney Renaissance. Not for the money aspect, but because it's just not that memorable to me. The film Mm -hmm. itself was not fantastic. I think overall it had like a decent storyline for you to watch the movie once and say, yep, I saw it, you know, but think of how many times you can watch The Little Mermaid and not get sick of it. Think of how many times you can watch Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Tarzan, Lion King, Pocahontas, Hercules, like all of these films you can watch over and over and you don't seem to get sick of it. More importantly, Think of how the songs resonate inside of you. You know, I know I probably know the soundtracks to Aladdin and Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast like in and out. You know, I could probably sing every single song from those soundtracks. And for me, Oliver and Company just doesn't fall into that category. It just the it, it was fine to see one time. It just it doesn't feel like it's connected at all with the storytelling and that feeling of connect that connection that you make with these other films that that start off with the little mermaid yeah yeah i can see all of that i I think those are all really good points um this your both of your comments has um brought up a a follow-up question to this which i'll i'll ask in a second but i kind of want to give my answer to this question as well um i I, in a lot of ways, I think I would describe it as this. I kind of see uh, the 80s as the rough draft for the final project, which is the 90s, right? Like I mm-hmm. see all of those films as like their sketches before they do the actual painting. And to me, that's all part of the same process. So I honestly would go back to definitely to Black Cauldron and maybe I might even just rope in Tron um because of its experimental uh edge that it has uh Uh but i would definitely go back to the black cauldron and consider that kind of the initial stirrings of uh what i would consider the disney renaissance and it and it really kind of for me um kicks in with great mouse detective for sure um but Here's here's a follow up question I have, because there are other properties associated with the Disney Animation Studio, which happened during this era, which we haven't even talked about yet. So um, in 1993, 
uh, Disney was associated with another touchstone picture called The Nightmare Before Christmas. In 1995, mm -hmm. Disney Toon Studio has a goofy movie. And in 1996, we've got James and the Giant Peach. Not to mention their um, co-development, co-production with Pixar on Toy Story, A Bug's Life, and Toy Story 2. Now, my question here is, do you consider any of those kind of ancillary associated films as a part of the Disney Renaissance? Or do you have the purest standpoint that it's only the things that came right out of the Disney Animation Studio? Pretty much animation. And I, that's a good question. Um, I don't consider Nightmare Before Christmas to be part of that Renaissance era. It's like a Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It stands on its own. And it's a different different way of animation. And just like Tron, it's, I mean, again, really good stuff. But it's one of those that stands by itself. Like, if it had its own little category, it's right there. Just <laughs> let it be. Party of one. <laughs> it's all good. It's the stop that, that's motion how I renaissance. See it. Right. And as much <laughs> as I love this film, I just don't consider it part of the Disney renaissance at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. What do you think, Hazen? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I think that's the common way of thinking about it, right? If it came out of the Disney Animation Studio, then it was certainly considered one of the primary Disney eras. You know, I think that's partially why something like uh, Frozen, you know, is in this revival era as what it's known for right now. But then something like Monsters Incorporated isn't because it was a joint venture mm -hmm. between Disney and Pixar. It wasn't straight out of Disney right. animation, but Wreck-It Ralph is part of the revival era because it was strictly Disney animation, right? So if right. for mm -hmm. the most part, I think most people in the larger percentile will always agree that in order to be classified in what's a canon era, it has to be strictly from Disney animation. Any joint ventures or anything that was purchased and it was an IP that Disney now runs in some way is going to be on a parallel timeline as far as an era that it falls into itself, including things like Who Framed Roger Rabbit mm -hmm. and these other films that came along with Pixar and Touchstone and stuff like that. Nice. I I tend to fall into the same camp that you guys do on that one. I, I was just curious to see if, if you would include it. Really, I wanted to snare Melissa into saying uh, <laughs> Nightmare is in the club. <laughs> but uh, I, I thought that was, that was an interesting idea. Um, okay. Well, we've done our best job of defining um, the Disney Renaissance up to this point. I, I feel like we've really had a good convo about it. Um, Here's an easy question for you. I, I think we may know a couple of our answers already, but what is your favorite Disney Renaissance film? Oh, man. Why do you and why? to me? <laughs> I feel like yours was easy. I, I thought I knew yours right off the bat. See, no? I get it, it really de depends on how you define favorite, right? Because I think there's a lot of aspects of yeah. what can be your favorite of something, right? Because I think... Mm -hmm. If, if I'm strictly going by the film, yes, my answer is always going to be Beauty and the Beast. But Beauty and the Beast right. is not the most superior animated film during the Disney Renaissance. So I think there was other films also that were right. vastly superior animation-wise to Beauty and the Beast. Story-wise, yes, Beauty and the Beast. If I'm going by favorite um scene like like just how scenic it was and the like you like you mentioned earlier the background i'm gonna go with lion king because it was just amazing and how it gave it that set that you put this entire story in but if i go mm -hmm. music wise i wouldn't be able to decide between aladdin and little mermaid so it really depends on which favorite you're trying to define if it's overall movie, I'm just gonna go with Beauty and the Beast, though. I like that. I, that's a good. That's a good way to put it. Cause yeah, yeah. I'm on the same boat. I, it's like favorite. Uh, okay, so overall, Lion King all the way. Cause nice. just, it's beautiful the way it's done, the music. I mean, it's just unforgettable. Mm -hmm. 
And but if I were to say my favorite female character and you know the film that she's in, it's Hunchback. And Ooh. it's just so, it's one of those movies that's just so different. And she's not a princess. She doesn't need a guy. She's doing everything herself. I love that. So in that sense, Hunchback will get my vote. Um, even though I love Little Mermaid and everybody else. But yeah, it, it all depends. So there you go. <laughs> nice. Well, for <laughs> my money, uh, my favorite is absolutely The Lion King. Um, I consider it to be the peak of the Disney Renaissance and their, their best film. Um, but if I'm pulling a haze in here and I'm compartmentalizing, uh, my favorite soundtrack hands down is Hercules. Mm -hmm. I've argued many times that I feel like top to bottom, it is the best Disney soundtrack. It's really good. And oh. then also like for just pure cinematic eye candy, I really think it's hard to beat Aladdin. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just, uh, yeah. you know, and I don't know. And I think probably of the entire decade, the genie is my favorite character as well. So it is, it's hard to pick from that, that lineup of films if you're looking at it from different angles. But I think, you know, I grew up as an Elton John fan and a Disney fan. And when that marriage happened, I was like, uh, count me <laughs> yeah. in. So th that one kind of just knocked it out of the park for me. Um, I love the storytelling, the, the up and down of it, and the, uh, the humor, the artistry. I, I think from A to Z, I think it is the best film of that era. So that's my pick. Um, all right. So let's talk about post-Disney Renaissance. Let's, let's talk about the influence a little bit. Um, we'll wrap up soon, but I just kind of want to get your guys ideas on how do you think the Disney Renaissance has impacted the Disney company in decades that have followed? And then just, you know, our culture, our, you know, social media, our, you know, pop culture sensibilities, uh, you know, since 1999. So I, th I think overall the Renaissance has produced so many memorable characters at a time where people were coming of age that it embedded the characters, their personas, what they stood for, and it created this deep-rooted love for those characters that has carried on in you know into adulthood for many people. And that influence has been passed down which is why things like every time a film came out of the Disney vault, people would buy it in the new version from VHS to DVD to Blu-ray to streaming it now on Disney Plus because they grew up with it and they want to pass on this to their children. So the cultural impact mm -hmm. that it's made is those films in particular will live on far longer in the minds of many people than a lot of the other films as great as they are than any of the other eras with the exception of the ones that are you know maybe from the golden age like snow white pinocchio dumbo bambi because those are just so classic that they kind of get melded into the passing on of the disney movie torch so to speak Mm -hmm. So because of that, people are always looking for what's next and how to represent that favorite character of theirs, right? So there's always going to be merchandise. There's always going to be ways to represent these characters because the, the demand is there. And Disney's all about supply and demand, right? If they know that something is hitting, they're going to want to start producing merchandise that goes along with that. And the more that it goes on, you start yeah. figuring out that you're always going to see these properties in circulation. So it's also one of those out of sight, out of mind things. Because of the demand, they're always in sight, the reason you don't see this huge cultural shift for the rescuers or the Black Cauldron is because the merchandise just isn't there. The demand isn't there. Mm -hmm. Do they have a fan base? Absolutely. But you're not going to see the same demand that you see for other stuff. You know, the reason we've seen this crazy resurgence of 
Disney afternoon stuff, for for instance, is because when the 90s kind of came back into style, all of a sudden people wanted to see these characters. And so Disney started hashing out more Disney afternoon rescue rangers and tailspin. And you don't you it's still not prominent, but you see way more of it than you used to. So it's really a supply and demand thing. And it's how people were affected by these movies and how they're passing it on from generation to generation to me. That's really good. I I, like that. I have like so many, so many little thoughts in my head. And I'm like, how I can't even bring up how to explain this, like how I see this. But a lot of it has to do with nostalgia. And like I ha- how I mentioned that one little spark that when I was a kid, I wanted to be this, you know, be this person or as growing up, I wanted to be that person. And yeah, just having everything come back. And it's funny because on social media now you have these memes, you know, scenes from the films that we didn't think were relatable. And now they are, yeah. you know, we relate to these villains now. And now we understand why they were so mad. But I mean, that whole era just just struck up so many different memories, emotions, like everything, all the feelings and whatnot. But yeah, just just like how you said, Hazen, the, the 90s when they brought everything back. Good Lord, yes. We just want everything, everything that wasn't available. And we wish they had a little yeah. bit more. It was, it was kind of this <laughs> weird set of movies. Not weird, obviously, but this set of movies that... I, I want to use the word weird or oddly, I guess, oddly kind of mm-hmm. didn't believe in the status quo. And they said, nope, this is how we're going to yeah. do it now. This princess can be mm-hmm. her own hero. This woman doesn't have to be a princess to be a hero, you know, or like the Little Mermaid breaking away from her dad and like just disobeying yeah. you know to go do this thing she wanted to do there wasn't this sense of i'm a delicate princess like there was with snow white and sleeping beauty and stuff mm-hmm. you know they they all kind of had this mind of their own all of a sudden that they seemed to lack in previous films and i think that in itself was this cultural shift to where we are now to having these strong female characters like anna and elsa for instance yeah yeah Right, Tiana, Rapunzel, yeah. Rapunzel who leaves. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think it definitely <laughs> is one of the earlier stepping stones for a lot of those themes that we see as much more prominent in today's storytelling. Um, you know, Hazen, you talked about how you know people want to pass this era on, so they, you know, have tried to keep these movies alive, and that you can follow the dollar signs, you know, because there's still a demand for these films. I think there's a demand for four to five of them, uh, but I think we're already starting to see that um, the entire era of the Disney Renaissance isn't truly as timeless as maybe it was originally considered to be. You know, if we think about the original golden era, you know, for decades after that, um, you know, Pinocchio was one of the prominent Disney properties. You know, that's why there's a Pinocchio attraction at the park, because it was one of their major brands and they sold lots of merchandise. Well, today there's no demand for Pinocchio. It breaks my heart because it's my favorite Disney film. But, you know, there is something to be said that, you know, it was created 80 years ago. We don't think about the world in the same way. We don't, um, you know, have different or we don't have the same sensibilities as we did back then. And so sometimes storytelling truly becomes dated. And I, th- I think we're starting to see some of those cracks form in some of the films in the Disney Renaissance. Um, but I do feel like uh, a handful of them are, are as timeless as Disney has ever created. And, you know, their influences felt very prominently so right now we all know that there's kind of this craze for the early 90s um maybe even the 80s but like fashions coming back with the you know high-rise jeans and you know all of it right like the highlighter colors and fanny packs yeah Yeah. fanny packs are like (laughs) hipster cool now and you know all this nostalgia this retro stuff is coming back well one of the things that's so predominant in this retro idea of the 90s is 
the Renaissance films from Disney because they are so much a part of what that culture was. You know, when I think back on the 90s, I think of Disney animated films. I think of like Michael Jordan in basketball. I think of, you know, the fall of communism, you know, like, like it's included in like all these big things, right? Like that's what I think of. I think of like desert storm and like, you know, major world events and the Disney films are part of that. Right. Uh, So I, I think like historically they made a mark on, culture specifically western culture and and definitely american culture to a pretty pronounced level and i think that um the era that directly followed it was a little too much in its shadow trying to be different than its big brother you know too much and not really succeeding and then it took a long time for this kind of revival to happen and you know when I think back on a lot of the Disney Renaissance films, they do feel of their time. You know, I spoke earlier about how they brought animation into the modern era. Well, that's not modern anymore. What's modern now is, you know, Big Hero 6 and Zootopia and Moana. Like these are modern animated storytelling vehicles Mm -hmm. and they're, you know, much more popular right now. Like we keep talking about how popular these films are, but like right now, like Moana is way popular really than any of these other films we're talking about. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's now and especially everybody under the age of 16 is much more in love with Moana than anything else, you know, that precedes it or frozen or whatever it is, you know? Uh, So, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I think it's always going to have its fingerprint on what follows but I think it has already begun to fade a little bit and, and will fade more in time. And it'll be interesting to see which one or two or two or three movies really stand the test of time. And in 50 years, we're still saying, oh, these are must watch Disney films, you know, with Snow White and Sleeping Beauty. And, you know, you pick and choose the one or two from each era. It'll be interesting for me to see which one survive the disney renaissance yeah you know i don't even think we need to wait 50 years i think this is a conversation that can be revisited in a year after disney plus launches and then you have Mm. um if there's a way to quantify yeah what the stats are of what gets watched and what doesn't this this certainly a conversation you can have in another year and kind of quantify and predict where in 50 years will be See, I, I love that you just said stats right there. I'm going <laughs> to close out our conversation on some stats. That's a perfect segue. It's the second time you set me up perfectly tonight. Nice. So. <laughs> you, you're, you're a pro host, my friend. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, as always, uh, I always like the stats. Um, and I just found this really interesting. I started thinking about this idea of influence. And it goes along with Hazen's, um, you know, follow the dollar signs. And these... All of these films, with the exception of one, really became franchises unto themselves and spawned many other things. Stage musicals, live action remakes, television series, short films, sequels or prequels, video games and park attractions. Now, I did a little research on this and I guarantee I missed some numbers here. But here is my initial estimation of what these 10 films also spawned so they spawned seven stage musicals seven live action remakes some of them are still yet to be made but they've been green lighted uh seven television series five short films 14 sequels or prequels many of which of course were direct to home video um yep (laughs) 30 yeah aladdin's one of them exactly 32 different video games. Whoa. Uh-huh. And including parades, 24 different park attractions throughout the world. Wow. Now, if we include Who Framed Roger Rabbit and Nightmare Before Christmas, two of our collective favorites, that adds another three shorts, another six video games, and another three park attractions. And that would bring us to a total of 108 ancillary things that these 10 films have brought us. That's not even including books, comic books, and anything else you can imagine. 
So th- it, it's had a huge impact on, you know, how Disney does its business because they really ramped up the idea that if something's a successful property, we have many more avenues down which we can travel mm-hmm. for revenue streams. And I think that's very apropos to what we see today as well. Yeah. Wow. Well said. Ah, man, those are some crazy stats, man. Right? Right. Like, I feel like I need to break out my own before we end. Like, well, I'll have you know that Chicken Little and Home <laughs> on the Range spawn 27 hate sites on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> they, I, I don't know if I just made that uh, up, by the way. I have no hate against Chicken Little and Home on the Range, by the way. <laughs> well, that's funny. So, Well, I, you know, in conclusion, I, I think it's it's – it goes without saying that the the Disney Renaissance is, if it's not the greatest era of Disney animation, it's at least number two. Um, and, you know, basically that and the golden era stand head and shoulders above any other era of yeah. Disney animation. And what it brought us was as timeless as can be hoped for uh, in a series of films. And I would definitely... Um, give a five-star review to pretty much all of them. And if you haven't seen any of these films, do yourself a favor, watch them either now or on November 12th when Disney Plus comes out. Uh, Yeah, it's, it's an era of Disney that inspired so many of us, made us Disney fans. Like Melissa said, it made me want to draw everything they ever created. And I still do to this day. So does Melissa. Hazen's designing graphics based on their stuff. I mean, we we're in love with it. So yeah. the Disney Renaissance gets our podcateers stamp of approval. <laughs> <laughs> just need like that sound effect of a stamp coming in. Just like, yes, <laughs> the old library, like you hear it hit the ink pad, the boom, and then the whap, whap, whap. on the book. <laughs> boom, whap. Exactly. Oh man. What a great segment, dude. I love this talk. Thanks. Love it. I great had fun choice, with it. man. Great choice. Yeah. Well, we want to hear from all of you. We love to hear what's your favorite Disney Renaissance film and tell us why. You know, obviously we all have different tastes and we all kind of grew up on Disney at different times, but it seems like the Renaissance is kind of that that midway point where a lot of people really kicked into Disney mode right uh or a lot of people were introduced to disney through these films so join the conversation over on facebook instagram twitter or on youtube leave us a comment and let us know what your favorite disney renaissance film is we'd love to share it on an upcoming episode uh remember that as we get closer to Black Friday and your Christmas shopping with all these sales that are popping up, one of the best ways to help out the podcast is by using our Amazon link. Head over to podcasters.com slash Amazon before your next purchase. Anything that you buy will still cost you the same amount of money, but guess what? We get a small kickback from Amazon as a thank you from your purchase. It's a, uh, Again, it's a great way to help support without spending any additional money. Uh, but if you do want to help us out with a small contribution monthly, you can also become part of the FGP squad. Again, podcasters.com slash FGP. And uh, that's it. That's going to wrap it up for this episode. Great conversation. Great topic, Gavin. I'm thank curious you. to hear what all of our listeners will share with us uh, through any social network so we can share next time. So yeah. definitely. I'd love to hear their answers to all of the questions I posed. Today. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. Yeah. All right. So until next time, keep dreaming, keep moving forward and always remember to pass on the magic. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. And uh, I didn't point it out earlier, but uh, you all know my sign off. It's from the Disney Renaissance. So without further ado, made you look. (laughs) Nice.